Hey, welcome back to the Rhetoric Warriors podcast. We are making the world better. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> By making you talk talk better, talk gooder. This is, uh, I'm Dr. Dan French, escaped professor, rhetoric warrior, founder of Rhetoric Warriors, PhD in rhetoric. I'm trying to get the world to understand that rhetoric means more than crappy political talk. And this podcast is one way of doing that. I interview comedians about their politics. I talk to conservatives about why they should stop being conservatives. And I talk to pers persuasion professionals and especially other rhetoricians, more rhetoricians than any other podcast in the world. That's the claim. My guest today, ah, I've known this person for so long and always been a big fan of hers. She's an academic teacher, like we we're we just talking about this. She's a multivariate yeah. academic teacher, writer, speaker, steeped in both the pragmatics of communication. She has a PhD in communication studies, and she's also steeped in the various mystical arts. That's mm. what I'm going to call it for now. Mm. Uh, and she's going to define that much more wow. coherently than I can. So uh, welcome, Dr. Christine Kaisinger. Thank you. You know, Dan, I, you and I met in 1990. That's and, like 80 years ago. And you were my office mate at USF in Cooper Hall. Cooper Hall. Yeah. <laughs> Was that the, with all the glass, right? Mm -hmm. But at some point, didn't uh, Virgil become my office mate? Maybe, maybe when we moved into the new building. But that's, yeah, uh, we building. were we were we met in late August of 1990. Was at the we were in that first cohort <laughs> of doctoral students at USF, and you were my office mate. I you know I can see I can see that moment in my mind's eye. I really struggled to remember the name of the building, um, but a, another one of our peers colleagues reminded me. Yeah, I. I... I don't know, like so many, you've transitioned at this point when you're in your fifties, you've transitioned through so many major environments, you know, major situations in your life that seemed like they were so dominant at the time. And now yeah. you remember, eh, I, I kind of, now I remember Florida being there. <laughs> yeah. Well, as I was telling you earlier, listening to the various episodes um, just brought me back to all of that and the significance of those years and really going deep into communication theory, rhetoric, cultural studies. Um, and for me, interpersonal and family communication studies and to see really, really strong threads of that now in the work that I'm doing, especially in the last year, the last 12 months, and really being appreciative of it. So talk about that a little bit. Just give people a quick overview. You started, like uh, you said, in 1990 on your PhD. You're from Pennsylvania, working class background. Mm -hmm. You got into communication studies and your parents were like, what are you doing? What is that? <laughs> yeah. But as I told you, my parents made it clear at a young age, no college. You know, if you want that, that's, you've, you've got to figure it out. And and they meant it because it was true. You know, there was no way of they, they could imagine ever funding that. So I was a first generation college student. And, you know, when I, I still have my day planner from my junior and senior year of college and I had five jobs. Like I literally had my life in 15 minute increments. But um, well, that's when one I of the interesting things about coming from the working class. And I was the same way, you know, my, I'm one generation off tobacco farms and I, I know what that world is like, and it's highly motivating to move away from it. Like it, it becomes this nice foundation of, oh, I don't want that. Ergo, I must work hard mm -hmm. to get what I do want. You know, I always wanted to be a cheerleader in high school. I wanted to be a cheerleader and I had to work after school. So I rode the bus down to the AM PM mini market of another small town, got a snack, and I walked to a dress factory for 3 p.m. 
And in the dress factory, there were women there who had been working from 7 a.m. So I had about a half an hour with them before they left for the day. And I worked there for two years and they would tell me, get out. You've <laughs> got, this is your life if you don't get out. And it was really that, it was really that experience that I thought I have to find a way. I have to find a way out. And the way out was community college. You know, $88 a credit right. was expensive at the time. And, um, but going back to sort of our rhetoric stories, my first public speaking teacher, uh, I hyperventilated during my first speech. And a few, a few class periods later, when she was handing back our speech grade, she asked me to stay after class. And she invited me to be on the forensics team. They had a robust budget. Like this community college traveled all over the country doing competitive speech. And to this day, I never had the courage to ask her if she invited me because she felt sorry for me. <laughs> Or if she invited me because she saw something in me that I didn't see. And I took the opportunity and that got me out of state. It got me all over the country and it got me all of this experience. And so you went from there to the University of Virginia? No, I went, I, then I went into a four-year um, institution, Wilkes University. I had another mentor there that said, you know, close to my senior year, well, surely you're not stopping. And, and again, it was like, what do you mean I'm not stopping? She saw something in me I couldn't see, which was graduate school. So yes, from there, I went to UVA. How could anybody and talk to you and not see intellectual? I mean, you're, you're so uh, able to absorb so many different things. Like you, I'm fascinated by the fact that you know so many worlds. You've become expert in so many different areas. I can't imagine, like even as a parent, not being able to see, oh, this child needs constant education. <laughs> I, I, again, it was just something that no one did. You know, no one, nobody did it. There was no, there was no roadmap for that. And I really had to, I really had to make my own way. Hence, you know, exorbitant student loans lots of side jobs. Um, but when I went to UVA, I had this really strange experience of being on fellowship. And I thought fellowship meant I was going to assist a professor in their research. But no, fellowship meant here's your textbook. Here's a sample syllabus. You're teaching your own classes. I was 22. And in the, in the classroom, two, two classes per semester and had no training whatsoever, but I, I, I knew I fell in love with it immediately. So they started you right off as a teacher, not even a TA or anything. No, <laughs> no, looking back, it's crazy to it imagine is. that, but that's what, that's what they did. That was very common. It just yeah, and it's, even... I don't, I don't think it's uncommon now. Like when I was no, in I don't Texas mm -hmm. as my, in my master's degree, I, ended, I was a TA the first three semesters for uh, Knapp and Hart, Rod Hart and David Payne. So I had two persuasions and one nonverbal. And then one day Knapp was like, uh, so you're teaching two classes next semester. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, we need, <laughs> we need teachers. So you're now teaching. Z like you said, zero instruction, zero training. They didn't even give me a syllabus. And I was teaching business and professional communication. And off you go. So that's right. That's right. Yeah. I, I mean, I didn't even know what I didn't know. So in a lot of ways, it was, it was great. And then when I got to USF, Art Bachner really, he gave me so much more, you know, it wasn't just the basic communication courses. It was interpersonal. It was family communication. And so when I left USF, I had this vast re repertoire of courses that I'd already taught and in some cases developed myself. You know, guys, um, people don't ever, nobody sees into organizations. They don't see the evil things going on and they don't see the wonderful things going on. But guys like Bachner 
you know, I don't know what he was before he got to USF and decided to blow up the entire field of interpersonal communication, <laughs> quantified history, but he was such a wonderful professor to, to enable people and empower people and bring them into that world. He did some really good stuff for people. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, when I went on the job market, which actually back then was really good. Um, there were lots and lots of jobs. Um, I really had an edge because I had so much teaching experience and I never, never doubted that part of my, um, my um, candidacy in any of those job interviews. But when I was um, quite young, I guess I was probably close. I was probably in my junior or senior year of college I went through a very, very transformational program um, once in the 1970s known as EST. EST. Now it's Ford known as the Forum, Air. right? Yeah, yeah. And so- It runs I, about half of Los Angeles. Half <laughs> of Los Angeles is Scientology. The other half is the Forum. Yeah, yeah. So I was, I was really young. I had no idea. I had always been completely fascinated by cults. I remain fascinated by cults. I think I was in a cult in a previous life. Huh. Um, but I got, I couldn't understand what happened to me. I knew, I knew that I wasn't drugged. I knew that it was a really intense psychological experience, like an immersion. Um, but I became fascinated by what I started to call the rhetoric of transformation. How does transformation occur through language and relational experiences and persuasion and presentation, right? And so that was really the, the work of my master's work was really looking at that. And I didn't realize because I leaned into David Payne's work and I believe he either wrote a book or an article called The Rhetoric of Transformation. Um, and when I got to USF, I didn't know David was there. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't, I did not, I went to USF because I was intrigued by Navita James's work, which I became familiar with when I was at UVA. And, you know, there was David Payne. Um, and, and his work really informed my master's thesis. But it was Art Bachner who said to me, this is a really interesting project. This thesis project is really interesting, but there's, why aren't you in it? Yeah, yeah, that, and it, that to everybody. You know, at UVA, they said, no, you got to write yeah, yourself out. you get out, out of it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was so intrigued by, wait a minute, I could do work where I out myself. And so, you know, that sort of led me down a different kind of path, but. I've always been interested in transformation and I remain very interested in it. Well, again, one of those things kind of inside, deep inside of institutions, you know, Bachner had his own transformation away from the foundations of, you know, how interpersonal got sucked over into psychology and social science. And, you know, after the war, that was the only thing getting funded in academics. And so everybody had to act like a social science scientist, even within communication, which is, a wholly reductive approach to communication that's just ridiculous. You know, if, if, if anything, communication is uh, in the majority mystical and unexplainable and weird, <laughs> you know, you can't get in there and study it directly the way that they want you to. So I always appreciate that he did that. But again, like he, by making that uh, possible from a power position down and, you know, opening the doors to people to be able to do that, he ended up kind of splitting the atom uh, in the field and sending a lot of people out like you who do, you know, very self-oriented and self-exploration and that kind of stuff to get to broader conclusions and useful information. And I watched it with you. I mean, I know when you came in, I remember when we were talking in the office, you'd come through a fairly traditional program like I did at UT. Mm -hmm. UT was heavily quantitative, even in the rhetoric people. They were yeah. counting everything. And, you know, I, you just sort of like, ah, uh, I can, <laughs> yeah, I saw it. Yeah. 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 So, um, I, you know, was in, you know, academia then for, 
when I count the years from teaching at UVA as a young graduate student through the day I retired, um, I was at the 30 year mark. Wow. Almost to the date. That's a good chunk of change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you considered yourself, you consider yourself an academic or a teacher? A teacher. A teacher. I uh, always, I found the, the other stuff draining. Um, interesting, but I never, I didn't do well with the pressure of it. I remember the best job I ever had at Southwestern University, um, which was so teaching, teaching oriented, right? It was perfect. It was a perfect environment for me, but there were always those, you know, uh, scholarly obligations and publications, those kinds of things. And then of course, there was always the, the service commitment. And it was a bit dismaying, you know, as a, as a new faculty member who came into the academia to teach and realizing that teaching is very little of what I do. Yeah, that's, it's crazy, right? I mean, that you think that's the job you're signing up for, and then you end up realizing, oh, I'm, that's so, such a small percentage of my time and energy and forced activity that, uh, yeah, it's a tough, it's a tough transition, I think, for people. When I was there, we had a strange situation occur. I was only there about a year and the chair who had been there forever left. He, he went out to California and I was an untenured faculty member made chair. And looking back on that experience, coming into a leadership position without any experience completely informs what I do today. Oh yeah. The ability Shape. to scramble and improvise. No, the ability to teach about leadership and what really matters. Okay. <laughs> what really matters. Huh. And, and, and feeling like I could speak to that with conviction. So what do you teach people about that? What, what lessons did you, did you extract from being thrown into the uh, deep end of the tiny shark pool? I think uh, um, when, when I'm called into companies now, organizations now, what I always know almost immediately is what they're calling me in for is not really what they need, right? That's step one. And then you start having conversations and you ask them like, well, what is your number one challenge here? Why am I here? Almost everyone across the board in the whole organization will say, well, we don't communicate. Well, what does that mean? Right. But no one can really answer that part of the question. What does that mean? But we know we don't communicate well. And so for me being in that position at a very young age, not tenured, you know, really feeling the pressure of, I can't screw this up on top of everything, all the, all of the other pressures was leaning into what I knew to actually work. And I was very aware of leadership as a relational enterprise. Right. And that those relationships were grounded in really good communication or not. And so whether it's coming in to do an intervention with a team or coming in to resolve conflict between two executives and sort of like a mediation role or um, helping an organization manage a change or transition, I, I almost always can see that the root of the problem is their failure to communicate, which then shows up in how they're not relating to each other very well. And beneath that, beneath all of that is there is unresolved, unmanaged, unleashed stress here. <laughs> yeah. And that's where we have to start. And so that's where my training in the area of mindfulness and increasingly neuroscience 
has been invaluable. So do you come in then and start at the physical, like with physical exercises, meditation, that kind of stuff to get them into a calmer state where they can then communicate? I almost always, unless it's some sort of crisis that has to be managed immediately, like with a communicative band-aid, I will almost always go to, there needs to be some sort of uh, stress management happening here. Now, it might involve um, meditation, mindfulness meditation techniques, but that's hard to sell in a corporate environment, right? Right. But what works is communicating with them in a way that they can understand what's actually happening in the brain when the brain is in stress response. And when the brain is in stress response, your capacity to problem solve, to think out of the box, to really, to really have access to that part of your brain that, that, mem that has memory of what worked and what didn't work in the past are all compromised. And so you're acting like a primitive cave person during your team meeting, which is causing everyone else to act in the same way. And so just training people to be able to shift pretty quickly from reactivity to a responsive mindset is invaluable. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I could see that. You're making me think of, there's a, a TV show called, oh gosh, something paradises. It's one of those uh, shows where people, they send three people in and they redo a, a bar in this beautiful setting or a restaurant that's failing. Mm -hmm. And it's fun to watch because the settings are just so dramatically beautiful. But one of them was somewhere in Arizona in the desert and they got there and the owner had made all these horrible decisions and, you know, the place was terrible and uh, they talked to her and within 30 seconds, she's just like bawling, just crying about how hard she's tried and all this stuff. And uh, the girl who uh, was one of the, one of the three hosts, turns to the other guys and goes, uh, I think we need to do some stress management. <laughs> and they send her to um, a place where they do bowls, mm -hmm. where they play mm -hmm. musical bowls, and then they get her a massage and a new haircut. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, so then they come back and have another conversation with her and she makes it like six minutes before she cries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there are really great ways to really biohack the system so that which doesn't require that you ever sit in meditation um you know there's things that you can do adjustments you can do in your posture really quickly no one would even have to know you were doing these things during a meeting where you start to feel wow i'm getting really triggered here um or i'm starting to behave in ways that are not aligned with the outcome i want to achieve by the end of this conversation. So I need to make some adjustments. And increasingly, um, now this can be in an, in an environment, in an organizational environment, this can be with a coaching client who's wondering if they should get, you know, a couple that's wondering if they should get a divorce or not. This can be in, um, I give trainings to families that uh, where there's trauma present and it's to really help them to parent better in traumatic uh, environments. So it could be any one of those environments when there's some sort of big upheaval happening that needs resolution, I can almost always track it back to, there's an unresolved, unmanaged stressor here that we're not trying to get rid of the stressor. We've got to transform how you're responding to it. Yeah, it's fascinating for rhetoric because this book that I'm working on, uh, 21 Coliseums of Persuasion, essentially is the metaphor that you have to understand all these different sort of locations where different type of messaging has to occur if you're going to win, you know, at your persuasion instance. And one of them is the psyche. You know, if you don't understand like what you're talking about, where people are hyper triggered and they're, you know, unable to process things cognitively, but you keep trying to do cognition into that, 
you're just fighting the wrong game in that coliseum like in those techniques you're talking about i see it a lot with public persuasion the wounded people who have lived a very wounding life and a lot of demographics are in that do not they don't want to hear humor <laughs> they want to hear you know they don't want to hear men talking about women's issues they don't want to hear white people talking about other ethnic groups because it, it's literally a trigger you are the the trigger yourself. And so unless you deal with some of that stuff and you acknowledge the fact that they've been wounded and they've lived a wounded existence, you, you, you shouldn't even be trying to talk to that group. Yeah. There's, I'm very, very deep right now into the development of a 12 week, a 12 week trauma training for, for a client. So Although I've developed a program, I'm really sort of amping up my own knowledge of all of this. And we pretty much have to assume <laughs> when we're dealing with people that we're dealing with individuals who have some level of trauma. Yeah, you can't go through the life without trauma. Like trauma no. is just the imprinting of a bad experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and our neurology holds on to bad experiences because it's trying to remember that to tell you, Oh, stay away from that next time. I mean, it's, it's a biological foundation of survival and, but we, we yeah. hold on to it so tightly. Mm -hmm. So when COVID hit, um, let's say about six months in when some leaders were thinking about bringing people back into the workplace. So you've got this collective trauma, right? And you have, or you have managers who, I had to do this training for managers who found their remote workforce to be very unruly. Like they, they work, they're not producing in the way that we want them to. Well, they're holding them to standards they were holding them to when they were coming to work every day. Right. Right, completely missing you know, in my job really was to come in and say, I want to let, I want to give you a glimpse into their heads. And um, when you can also work with, with people at that level, like these are basic ways in which COVID has triggered so many of us. And then if I have a better sense of what's been triggered in you, then it's my responsibility to shape my message to that. Right. I've got to motivate, inspire, educate at, to where you are. And I've got to find a way to lift you up. It's a lot. It's a lot for leaders, managers. Um, I mean, we, we, we're, we are in a land with no map at so many different levels. Well, and you see it playing out in parents trying to not only learn speed, learn how to teach and speed, learn the content that they're supposed to help the kids with, but also speed, learn zoom and all that kind of stuff. That's just a cr crazy, like my, my son finished high school early. He took a bunch of online courses because he was tired of high school and he finished two weeks before COVID hit. Thank God, because yeah. I mean, my kids were both really good at academics, so I didn't have to do a lot mm -hmm. with them, but mm -hmm. just a little bit that I did to help them through stuff, like the conversations, the repetitiveness, the, the you know, slowness to learn, all these things that are natural for kids, just drive you crazy, especially if you're like an academic and you're used to thinking mm -hmm. fast. Mm -hmm. And just slowing things down to that super slow mo. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. It's I, I feel so bad for parents having to try to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're coming into these organizations. So tell me about your transition. Like I, I know you transitioned, you were at Georgetown for a while for quite a teaching for quite a while, right? Was it George, George Washington? Washington? George Washington University. Yeah. And then um, my husband and I moved here to the Northeast where I grew up uh, when the kids were getting ready to enter li their later years of middle school, just because it was um, kind of a, a safer environment for them. And that's when 
I really began to feel the effects of what it means to still be connected to a university, but at an adjunct level. Really difficult. Yeah, you were really, a barnacle really, at best. <laughs> really difficult transition. Now, I will say that I never, I did not leave academia because of the, ch of the children, the students or the, um, the teaching. I had a moment, I, I'll never forget it. I was teaching a course called Creativity and Innovation in Leadership. This is the last university class that I taught. It was toward the end of the semester and my students Somehow we got off on a tangent. I think I said something like, oh, your teaching evaluations are gonna be emailed to you because now they're all electronic. Please make sure you, you fill them out. And a student raised his hand and said, hey, Dr. Kreisinger, do teaching evaluations really matter? And I said, you know, they, they do, they do. They matter to a professor's tenure. I mean, I said, really, for most, for most universities, the teaching evaluation is the only evidence that is looked at as to the quality of someone's teaching. I said, did you ever see anyone come into this classroom or any classroom to observe your professor teaching? And mostly it's no, right? Right. So anyway, we went on, on and on about that, but I was trying to, I wasn't, this didn't affect me at all, right? But I was saying, take them seriously. You've got to fill them out for your other professors that are on tenure track. And they were like, oh, don't worry about it. We're gonna give you positive evaluations. It, this was an out of body experience. <laughs> I said, don't worry. This is my last semester, I'm retiring. The, like I, I was hovering above myself and right. I said the words and I didn't know why I said them. And it felt right. It was a great semester. I loved teaching that content. And it was sort of like, I'm going out when it's good. Right. And I'm going to trust. But, you know, concurrent to that, my corporate work was far outweighing what was, you know, available to me. There were no tenure track jobs. And I didn't want to go back through the tenure track process. The days of getting hired, once you've had tenure, if you leave it, the days of hoping you're gonna be hired back somewhere with it, uh-uh, no more. Very, very rare that that happens. They start you over? They might That's give you a couple of years toward, and I just thought, God, you know, you work so hard for that, it felt, insulting it felt like i just i did that <laughs> i don't want to do <laughs> that again um and then there was this real sense of there's so much value in what i do for all of these other people and i don't grade <laughs> well yeah like all you know all that kind of stuff where you're like you know, I've, ar I've argued forever that combining the job of teaching and grading is inherently cruel to everybody <laughs> because that's a, totally against the nature of teaching. Teaching is just giving, mm -hmm. giving as much as you can. They can absorb whatever they want. Great. And you just keep giving and then grading what they took. Mm -hmm. Like, no. <laughs> oh, I love that. I never thought about it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I felt that way. And I don't miss that part. I, I do, I'm very fortunate that there's one university that I come in a few times per year and I've been doing that virtually. So I still have experiences with students, but there's, there's no grading. Um, but uh, I just, it just felt like, it felt like the right thing to do. And I also knew that if I wasn't teaching anymore, I knew that other doors would open and, and that's, that's indeed what happened. We'll talk more about what you're doing now, this idea of, cause I've enjoyed, I think what you're doing is probably more along the lines of what I would like to move towards about bringing specific knowledge into specific situations 
that alleviate problems. So I got called up once to do a seminar at the Naval War College to come in and they have a think tank there. And they, they found me because they were, they try to identify whatever people in the world can make them think differently. Yeah. And so uh, they brought me in because they originally started with comedy. They're like we're looking for a, a comedian of, you know, who has some kind of, you know, depth to what they do. Uh, and then we found you and you also have a PhD in rhetoric. And we don't know what that is either. So why don't you come up here and talk to us for a day? And I did. And I went up there and it was just the best experience because not, it, it was maybe 75 people in the room and commanders from all different branches of the military, all different levels. And they, they could actually use the stuff I was saying, like for real. I mean, these people were killing people for a living. And I'm like, you know, you may not have to do that. Yeah. There may be other ways if you get good at this other stuff where you augment your killing with, you know, this type of approach. <laughs> and it was just great. I'm like, oh, this is what I want to do. This coming in and saying, look, I can add to your skill set mm -hmm. so that you can avoid some of the issues that are, you know, plaguing you in this kind of, this kind of work. But so I've always enjoyed that and I've gotten to do, you know, different things like that over the years, but, um, but talk about that. Cause that, I'm sure you had kind of the same feeling of this wealth of things you've thought about and developed for decades. Mm -hmm. And now you can just sort of pluck a piece of it and bring it over here and just drop it down like an arcade arm and go, Oh, here, this will help you people. Yeah. So, so you know, that's, first of all, that's a great example. What you describe the, the elation that's associated with, I just spent a day with 75 people and I, and you, you, I don't know how the degree to which you prepared, but it's probably likely that you didn't have to prepare that much, but you were able to just grab stuff, you know, based on what they were identifying are their issues, right? Mm -hmm. And then the identification of the issues or what they bring forth as what I call their presenting problem. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and then you get to get them to think very differently about what that problem is. And sometimes it's not a problem at all, but it's usually something else that they're struggling with. And then we've got these remedies and a variety of them. And if something doesn't work, then we're going to try something else. But um, I was making a list of, of, of things that, that I tend to do inside of organizations, right? So there's um, enhancing leadership. And sometimes that means, you know, we're pretty good leaders here, but let's like bring it up to the status of exemplary, of exceptional. And the key to exceptional leadership in most organizations is communicating better. Um, and the way that I like to describe it is let's move you into conscious communication. And that's the word that I like to use. And Eric Eisenberg just wrote a book with a partner called stop wasting words. And in the subtitle is the, is the words conscious communication. And they do a really good job of really getting us to see, um, how wasteful so much of what we say actually is. And there's no consciousness or intentionality behind it at all. And worse, there isn't even any attempt to check out whether the person we're addressing or the team that we're working with even grasped what we thought, you know, what we hope, what we were intending. Um, so conscious communication and training them how to be present, how to actually show up in their communication in a way that they're engaging, like what are tools and skills you can use to engage, um, how to actually create connection with others that actually feels very meaningful as opposed to a means to an end, like meaningful and sustainable and um, does what I say or how I show up actually create momentum in this organization or in this conversation or in this team meeting so that by the end of it, we've actually moved forward, even if it was just a tiny bit. 
as opposed to staying stuck or stagnant. So give me and an example, drive this home a little bit with, talk about like something specific that um, you feel like one of the tools that you use consistently and you can drop it in there and, and you saw it work. Um, okay, I'll give you a, this is one of, this is a gem. Uh, you're a frustrated leader because you're dealing with a team that in your, in your eyes has not been functioning very well in the last six months. And again, you're relying on your old pre-COVID leadership skills because you don't have the self-awareness and the other awareness to realize that those old ways don't work anymore. So let's say you've got a, a couple of really, really triggered reactive team members and you really want to change the way you're communicating with them to try to make a difference. So you're going to do a little analysis as to what might be triggering them. And you're going to pull out of your pocket, your note card that Dr. Kaisinger gave you with the SCARF model of human need and threat. S stands for safety security. C is certainty. A, autonomy. R, relationship. And F, fairness. For most human beings, when our safety and security is threatened, we're gonna be triggered. For most human beings, we thrive in certainty, routine, predictability. When things are uncertain, high, high level threat, perhaps, high capacity to be triggered. Whenever our autonomy is uh, threatened, our sense of independence triggering. Whenever our relatedness feels threatened, can be triggering. And then F stands for fairness. Whenever I wonder, are you treating me fairly? Are you treating me with dignity and respect? If that's even questioned, high capacity for triggering. So I'm wondering why I'm getting a lot of pushback or resistance from this one team member. I can run myself through SCARF and I can say, wow, you know what? We used to run the show in that department before COVID. I am micromanaging him. I've really taken his autonomy away. And what if I sort of loosen the reins a bit? You know, maybe that's what it is. So that's just a tool. It's a tool that comes from neuroscience and any one of those things, if they are threatened in me, I'm gonna be on the edge. When more than one or all five are triggered, tough place to be. And when you think of, when you think about COVID, our safety, our certainty, our autonomy, our relationships, how many people felt ripped off. We had to cancel my daughter's wedding or I couldn't watch my child walk across the stage for graduation or I lost my husband at a young age. The fairness, dignity, respect piece, we've got a world of people on edge. And layer on top of that, the, the, the political climate we've been living in of, <laughs> you can see all of, all of that there. Um, and then, uh, you know, all of the social civil unrest we've experienced over these months. I mean, we have, how, how we've not blown ourselves up or maybe we have in a lot of ways, right? So that's just an example of a tool because once I have a sense of, you know what, this person's safety and security is really threatened right now. How can I now relate to him or her, communicate with him or her in a way that restores some sense of certainty here? Yeah, I think that, you know, again, this is what people miss when they don't get, and most people, you know, God love us as a, as a 
species. We don't get a lot of training, you know, like just that the idea of, oh, here are five uh, letters and an acronym, which will focus this amorphous issue into something that can be tactically approached. So if you realize, oh, this person is feeling that this isn't a fair situation, you can now drive your communication towards fairness. You can write script around fairness. You can ask questions around fairness and make some progress. And that kind of very specific breakdown of a psychological state and then the communication you know, that can help it, that's actionable, right? People yes. can do that. Mm -hmm. But you can't do like, hey, you know, you need to manage better. No. And, you know, and, and he, here's when you know that what you're doing really works. It's when you introduce these tools and then the actual culture of the organization, it becomes part of their vocabulary. Like, hey, Dan, you know what? In the meeting, I noticed that you seem to be getting a little bit triggered. And I started to wonder if, um, I mean, I don't know how I would say it exactly, sure. but you know, you don't, you don't want to say to someone, I think your autonomy has been triggered here. I'm going <laughs> to loosen the reins a bit. But there's a way to do that, you know, yeah. and, some, and sometimes, um, you know, people really struggle with empathy. Like what is empathy? Like, what is it really? And there's a lot of confusion about empathy and sympathy. And sometimes you act, I have to actually give what I call empathy scripts. This is what it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And no, I find all that stuff very, uh, like I, so with my son, you know, I had, you, you were a parent, you had to do trainings, specific trainings with them and you can't use abstract terms. I like he was, so he had two girlfriends before he was 16 and both of them ended fairly badly and like the second one and I was driving home with him and he was quiet so I'm like okay something's going on this kid's never quiet I'm like what's the deal he's like nothing I'm like oh is it such and such is she giving you you know is like you having problems with that and he's like yeah he goes like uh she's anxious all the time and I don't like it like she makes me repeat things she you know gets obsessed with things that I don't care about and yada 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 and I'm like so it sounds like you're ready to end the relationship He's like, yeah, I think so. I'm like, do you know how to do that? Uh -huh. No, I have no idea. I'm like, okay, well, we are going to do a training. <laughs> I'm going to give you a script mm -hmm. and it's going to be very effective and we're going to practice it for the next day or so. And then you're going to do it if you want. And, you know, I did, I gave him the script and he, he used it and he's like, oh my God, that was, that worked so well. I'm yeah. like, yeah, you know, when you get, when you get into human interactions that need solutions, you can't just improvise your way through it very successfully, very often. You know, that's why I look at your training, your training went, I took a bunch of interpersonal and we took a bunch of classes together, but for me, it was more kind of, you know, just sort of shopping, just window shopping through interpersonal. And I taught it and I, I really liked that stuff, but I've watched you just go so deeply into it and all the healing modalities that you've gone into, you know, just to explore the potential and all these different things. And I'm sure like when you come into these situations with businesses, like you're saying, they can only accept a certain level of healing and like, it has to come through some type of quantified, it has to be somewhat rational and that kind of stuff. But it seems like you've done a really good job of infusing that system with that same feeling towards we can work our way through this if we understand some tools. Yeah. And again, um, in any corporate environment, um, you can, when you start to bring neuroscience in and our neuroscientific research, especially as it relates to stress response right now is so vast and so compelling. And so part of my job is taking that and translating over, translating it over into uh, these various audiences. Um, but well, that rhetorically, it's good cover, right? It's a lot. It's a lot easier to sell neuroscience than Reiki. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that, and that's that's a 
that's a very, I don't bring any of that sort of thing into my corporate work, but I also think that those kinds of things infuse my presence, right? So then there's that piece as well, is how are you showing up as the, as the one who wants to enroll them in your product? How are you showing up as the one they're gonna hire to be their facilitator? And I rarely do one and dones. Um, I like a year commitment or more. Um, I have an incredible client who, um, I'm in a three-year commitment, commitment with this client now. And, you know, one of the things that really worked was after the executive team went through the training, which was never the intention, right? The executive teams bring you in because there's problems below, right? Right, right. And then you're like, you know, it would be really great if... <laughs> you did this first and when they do and then they become the walking talking expressions of the training and people notice and then okay now this other level wants to come in and then i put them in the master class right yeah that feels good we're in the master class now of leadership excellence or or whatever you want to call it and um and then you can work with them at an advanced level because they've got that, they've got the basics. But the other thing that I wanna share is what's really been invaluable also is a foundation in emotional intelligence. When you look at all the core qualities of emotional intelligence, every one of those qualities in order to actually have them is communication based. And I explain that. What do you mean by that when you say it's communication based? Well, the four traditionally, the, the five, the five qualities of what it means to be emotionally intelligent are self-awareness, self-management, intrinsic motivation, empathy, and strong social skills. I probably spend the most time on the self-awareness piece. And I regret in my communication training, not spending enough time in the area of intrapersonal communication, because that's how I teach about self-awareness. Right. What is your relationship to you? And really getting them to look at what is the kind of communication that's occurring in your own head, that's shaping your reality, or that's shaping how you're perceiving this person who's a constant irritant during a team meeting. Um, and really, if you don't have that first, first quality, you can't have any, anything else. Um, so, but, but each of these qualities, getting them, cultivating them and sustaining them, and then getting excellent at them are all a matter of becoming a better communicator, especially the fifth quality, which is strong social skills. It's so vague. But right. here you're talking about speaking, you're talking about listening, you're talking about your nonverbals, your paraverbals, you're talking about mean, shared meaning, you're talking about, um, you know, corporate culture, you know, what are you, what vibe do you want to infuse into this culture and how is that going to happen relationally, communicatively. So, um, Sometimes that's, those are my touchstones, depending on the organization. Like this is going to, they don't even have to know that. But my year with you is going to be a deep dive into each of those five areas. And we're going to communicate our way through, we're going to communicate our way into getting really good at those things. Yeah, it's interesting. The, uh, one little area of the sub area in politics that I do for rhetoric warriors about con converting conservatives. Yeah. I'm essentially harvesting from all the interpersonal stuff and saying you can't get into politics or political discussions with the opposition without creating a relationship with them. Yeah. And so like just the tool of validation instead of challenge, everybody wants to challenge the other side's foundational beliefs and worldviews. I'm like, good luck, because you're just triggering defenses. 
if you do validation, even soft validation, like not validation, the content, but validating the person or validating, you know, the fact that I know you're trying to, you know, say the best things that you can for your family and for America and for yourself and all these things, it gives them space, you know, to not see you as an enemy and not see this communication as an attack. And it's really hard to teach people to do that because they get triggered when they're going up against conservatives because they're like the worldview and like the, how can you Trump? Oh my God. And I'm like, well, you got to do some training with yourself if you're going to convert those people, you know? And I get this. I've always had this with you. Like I know you kind of as a person and we sort of grew up together through academics. And then I know the Buddha like Christine who, when you teach and you have this peacefulness to you that you exemplify. And I think that you exude and that people react really well to, I think that's probably part of the real secret why you're successful at this stuff and successful as a teacher, because you do show empathy. You do show all those things that you talk about. And they're so natural to you that I'm like, if you would, if I would show video of you, like see her, she could talk to somebody who disagrees with her mm -hmm. and not trigger them. <laughs> it's really, really important to me to, I call it, you know, people walk your talk, whatever you want to call it. But for me, it's embodied. It's in, I am, I, I embody what I teach and I, I won't teach it if it, if I haven't used it or if it doesn't work or I, I won't even venture to do it because it won't be convincing. But um, something that's been really important for me in organizations is, especially with leaders, is how do you embody your leadership? How do you walk into the room as a leader before you even open your mouth? And um, when you show up, what do people feel? Right. And this has, this has taken on a totally different level in this format. When I show up and I've never met this group of individuals in this organization, and I've just been hired to give you a year's worth of training. I have to embody my values about all of this in a way that's very different from showing up um, physically. So um, I'm glad that you said that because it's really important to me. And you know, I, I don't know if people feel that or not, but, and it isn't, it isn't even at this point, something that I wake up every morning saying you have to embody your, you know, your stuff. It just is. Yeah. And I think that authenticity comes through. You're, you're very, you strongly signal these things that you've committed to, you know, you see the value of them. You're not, you're not selling this. You're not pretending it. You're not trying to amplify it to, increase the power of the signal. It just is the signal because you made these decisions. You have strong uh, affirmations about these things and, and it's impossible for you to not communicate them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. That means a lot to me. And it's probably one of the most important things I try to teach. Well, and that, that creates a self-awareness that some people prior to hearing that didn't have before. You know, there's not any sort of attention paid to how am I showing up right. in this meeting, in this conflict, in this parenting moment? And um, how does that make people feel? Because really, it really doesn't matter what I say. <laughs> <laughs> what matters is, is how, that, how that made them feel. That's what they're going to remember. Right. And I think that's one of the things for me that's always been very useful about comedy. Comedy is such a strong signaler, you know, that, hey, we're going to have fun here. I, I want to enjoy this interaction with you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some people fear comedy because they've seen kind of the aggro comedy that attacks people, but I never do that. So mm -hmm. my stuff is always mischievous or playful or oriented okay. to everybody enjoying this experience. And I know how to send that signal. I've done it as a professional comedian for decades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you walk in the room and you put that into the room, mm -hmm. consciously walk in and, you know, you just kind of look at people, it just takes over the tone the same way you take over the tone. Like if I were sending you in somewhere, 
I know what tone you would walk in with. I would know the emotional flavor and the chords that you're hitting. You have almost an orchestra of emotions that you just demonstrate. And that to me, again, is what becomes very, very powerful and very, very valuable for a trainer or for somebody, you know, that can come into situations that don't, they don't get that. Like they're literally starving for it in organizations. They don't have this rich emotionality and things that human beings need to stay happy and communicative. Yeah. You know, um, Dr. Vivek Murphy, our, I believe he's our new surgeon general. He was the surgeon general during the Obama years. And I believe Biden and Harris brought him back. But prior to COVID, he had published a series of seven essays in the Harvard Business Review on workplace loneliness. And it was based on a study that, I think he started this study when he was in the Obama administration. He was studying organizations. I don't remember what he was studying, but it turned into this big pool of research about workplace loneliness. And you know, one of the things he cites is that the isolation and lack of connection that is often felt in workplace environments. This is pre-COVID. Um, over time, the wear and tear that it can have on the human body is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. This is like how serious lack of meaningful connection in our workplace can be because we spend most of our time there. And um, I became very familiar with his work before COVID, right before COVID, because I was doing some work in an organization that really wanted to make a cultural shift because they were just tied to like a 50 plus year history that no longer was applicable to who they wanted to become. But this idea of belonging I was really on my radar. Nobody here knows where they fit. If they fit, you know, this is a place where it would be really hard to come to work here every day because there's not anything about it that's socially gratifying. And, and then I stumbled upon his work and I, cause I really started thinking about how do you create a culture of belonging? I mean, it sounds, you know, I don't even, I don't even know if that, I don't even like saying it, but it's so important, right? right. If we could call it something different, but um, so then I really started thinking about it in terms of now what's happened with remote work. Because clients that I was working with would say, what I miss the most is the kind of work that gets done when you pop into my office and we have a cup of coffee together and we're talking and suddenly we've resolved a work problem or the kind of work that gets done when we're walking down the hallway. Um, and those kinds of things are very difficult to replicate in this environment right yeah it's it's absolutely like so i i learned very quickly doing corporate marketing marketing work creative work within corporate marketing they would bring me in to rename things or sometimes to figure out new stories to tell and things and their only work structure for creative work was let's all have a meeting Let's all, let's all meet and we'll just talk, you know, we'll brainstorm. And I'm like, oh my God, you are killing me. Like Hollywood, Hollywood has a very defined creative pipeline and you would never put the wrong person in the wrong section of the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Like there are some people that are very conceptual and there are some people who are just very good at tactics. Like I have a friend who's made a living in Hollywood for 30 years and he writes one kind of joke and it works very well, but it's the only kind of joke he can write. Right. I've never even really heard him say anything funny, Right. but if yeah. you give him two hours alone in an office, he writes the three biggest jokes in the show every mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. but it's a very specific tactic. So you don't want him involved in anything else. If you bring him, and I saw it, people bring him into the first meetings, the concept meetings, the decision meetings, all that, he would sit there for an hour and say nothing. 
and people would be uncomfortable. He would be unhappy. And it was a completely unproductive hour. So finally I told the head writer, I'm like, Hey, just send, send Peter to another, to his office. There's no reason for him to be here. And he's like, yeah, you're right. He never says anything. Mm -hmm. And so like Hollywood's very structured in its creativity and business doesn't have any of those architectures. So it's all meeting, 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 which is what zoom has become, right? We need to have a meeting on this and it's this formal structure like the, yeah. How do you do just maybe 15 minutes of social hour every day on, so on zoom where everybody cannot talk about work. Everybody has to get together something, you know, to break that rigidity of the communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you're making me think about, I just did one this morning. Um, some of my clients, like they'll have me like this morning I came in and I worked with a small team. And basically what I did was I led, I facilitated a conversation about how they're all doing, <laughs> you yeah. know, but I sort of had to be there to feel, to facilitate that. Sure. Um, and it's, and this was a, I mean, there were people crying, there were people, this was strictly like well-being hour, you know, um, because we, we, because they can't go back to work quite yet. I don't know that they will go back to work. And there are lots of pe people that are not going back to their actual building. They're built, they, the buildings are gone now. The, the lease is over. Right. And so this is it. And so I think that there's an opportunity for people who do the work that we do. I mean, that, that's, it's, it's, it's basically, I'm holding, creating space in the Zoom world <laughs> for it, these teammates to have a conversation about what's really going on for them that might be affecting their actual work. Right. And I'm not giving advice and I'm not solving problems. I'm just holding the space for them. Well, you remember the studies, I think it was in the sociology of work, maybe it was Newman's class, but where the cigar rollers in Ybor City, the Cubans, uh, the Cuban workers would have storytellers that would mm -hmm. sit while the women were rolling cigars all day, and they would literally pay somebody to sit there and tell them stories to get wow. them through the day. Yeah. And it's, it literally, it's exactly what you're talking about, mixing something into just productive, you know, activity so that your brain can be a, be what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be multiplicitous and, you know, this sort of human way of that we think and that we feel you can't just get rid of all that just because now we're all on zoom yeah. and you giving them a different context mm -hmm. for using zoom for a different type of communication makes mm -hmm. perfect sense to yeah. Yeah. add variety to this and make it more natural. Yeah. And that same organization um, has me every other Friday and I do an hour for the entire organization on a different topic that's related to well-being. And well-being can be, uh, there, for me, it's, it's five facets. It can be their physical well-being, their cognitive well-being, emotional, relational, and their professional well-being. So we've been spending the last several months strictly on relational well-being. And, you know, this, this, so that now you're in all the interpersonal stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, uh, yeah, I've got endless amounts of content all tapped back to those days at USF and UVA and yeah, you have endless pools of content. Mm -hmm. And really, if they'll ever recognize it, endless clients out there who need it, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you know, so I was thinking about this in preparation for our time together, which is, and, and also because um, in April, I'm leading a workshop that's actually funded through NCA through a grant. And it's a workshop where they have, I think four or five of us doing workshops on it, can there be a life? It's for graduate students. 
is there a life that you can create for yourself that is alternative to academia? Now, this for me would have been unheard of in grad school. Right. It, I, it would have scared me to even imagine that I'd have to think about that. And you know what? We didn't have any training for that. None. Did we? No, zero. <laughs> like it was completely an academic factory. Right. So, so this is needed now. This is, this is needed now because there is not the promise of a job after this. And if there is the promise, if there is a job, it's not necessarily going to be tenure track. So I started thinking, I've been thinking a lot about how do you sell yourself? How do you talk to organizations um, about what you do, which was largely rooted in an academic environment and how, it trans and how you translate it over into um, a corporate environment? Well, it's fascinating because most of the stuff I think that you've been doing is this internal health of the organization, you know, and the people within the organization. And what I do is more of the consumer facing out, outgoing messaging for businesses, but I've told them, you know, I started dragging in, I can't help it. I have to drag in theory. I can't just do strategy and tactics. That's just not who I am. So I was looking at this stuff and I kept going, why are you guys failing? Why is your outgoing messaging failing? And then I finally was like, oh, it's because you're all living in a world that doesn't exist anymore. Like what has happened now, this old world media that you guys have grown up on as, as that our capitalism has grown up on has disappeared. There's no, there's no extant TV and radio and things like that. There's this hyper personal social media and digital experience, which means everything now has turned into a relationship. Like you do not buy from companies that are called General Electric because you don't know anything about General Electric. You need to know who's there and what they do and what their social programs are and all that kind of stuff. You need a relationship with them. So, you know, if there's this thing in marketing about relational marketing but they kind of just give it lip service. Mm. And finally, I was like, look, I, we're going to do products that are going to create real relationships with your consumers. And they're going to stick to you like you've never seen them stick before. Yeah. Because you are actually treating them well, which is what you do to create a good relationship. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, oh, what do you mean? I'm like, no, no, no. Think about it. That's what you need to do as a business. You had to actually te treat people well. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what has become the foundational theory and how, of how we do marketing for this company for 500 Rockets is we're going to build relationships that are real. Customers are going to value and therefore you won't even have to hardly persuade them at all. Yeah. You know, and it's sort of your stuff, again, moved over into this kind of public externalized messaging, but you have to send out validation. You oh, have to yeah. send out empathy. Like we know, you've seen this with COVID and businesses. We know everybody's struggling out there and we're still going to charge you. I'm like, no, 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 that's not, <laughs> that's false empathy. You know, that is not real empathy. Like you have to commit and do it for real and making that transition to get people to start to see that that's what superpowers their messaging and superpowers the relationship and ultimately superpowers the capitalist transaction Mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of education again. That's all theory. If you get them over there, like you've done with your organizations about, Hey, there's real value in having healthy employees, yeah. you know, and leaders. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's cool to see. I'm really, I'm really yeah. happy to see you've adapted that stuff to this new application. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I think now the challenge is spending some time reflecting on how I've actually done it because it's so natural to me. Um, and in having this opportunity to, to, to be with these grad students, I'm gonna really have to map out, like what has my strategy been? Um, and get sort of more methodical about, like what's the recipe for that? Right. I know it can be done. 
Yeah. Now you just have to, be able to explain it to people so you can tell it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, this has been super yeah. fun. We're uh, oh, like thank an you hour so 15 much. minutes. Yeah. And so I forgot we were podcasting, which is yeah, always- Yeah, no, this is great. <laughs> I, I, I want, I tell everybody almost after, at the end of these, I'm like, I want to circle back around and talk again, you know, fairly soon, just because it's so much fun and there's so much here. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're doing good work. And, and I think as I'm listening, I'm also listening to what I imagine other people are hearing that don't have a background um, in rhetoric. And I love that you're using the word rhetoric. It's very funny to hear the response. A lot of times people are like, why would you possibly, I'm like, well, look, you don't really understand what rhetoric is. You, you've been, it's been maligned, poor rhetoric, you know, it's been stained, yeah, but yeah. so yeah, it is a good trigger word. That's, mm -hmm. that's the important part. And then retrain people to it to say it's, there's a lot here. It's a lot useful here. Yeah. There's a lot of good. And I do like, you know, in your intros, you always use the word good yeah. for the good. And yeah, so you're doing good work. I'm a big fan. It's my favorite podcast right now. And I'm a huge podcaster. So, well, that's awesome. I've got one fan. So I'm, I'm <laughs> that's all I was really after. So, yeah. So. All right. So let's do this again. Okay. Sounds great. Anything you want to tell people to go look at before we go or? Yeah, um, come to Dr. Christine527 at gmail.com. Dr. Christine527 at gmail.com. And I will send you a gift. You'll get a gift. You get a gift from Christine. That's a gift to, um, wow, um, prime your mindset for excellent communication. I like it. Good pitch. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Christine. I appreciate it. Super fun. Yeah. And uh, this has been the Rhetoric Warriors podcast. Keep going out there and persuading people. They need it. And we, uh, we can do it. You just got to keep working at it. I'll see you next time.